Good afternoon, everyone, and apologize for a little technical delay. Um, we're really thrilled to get started with uh, a webinar related to Divinistat, which is an HDAC inhibitor. And with us this afternoon, we have the Vice President of Research and Development for uh, for the company Italopharmaco, which is Paolo Bedica. So, Paolo, um, in the interest of time, because we have a lot to talk about today, I'm going to turn this webinar right over to you. Thanks, Pat. Uh, thanks for hosting us uh, and to uh, give us some time to talk uh, about our trial. In the interest of time, let me uh, give you my disclaimer that will come up in a second. So, I'm a, a full-time employee of Vital Pharmaco, uh, and uh, I will be talking about Givinostat. Givinostat is in development in uh, uh, the U.S. and also in Europe, so it's not available uh, on the market. And obviously, all the information which I will be sharing are um, obviously uh, scientific information and information on the uh, trial. So, uh, this is a, a description of what I'm going to uh, be talking about. Uh, first of all, I'm going to remind you the role of Givinosta, also uh, called ITF2357 uh, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Then we will be reviewing uh, the uh, phase two results, which are obviously at the basis of the study that I'm going to describe then, which is called the APD study, which is our pivotal trial that hopefully will lead uh, to a registration. And then we'll have some time for uh, Q&A. Okay, so uh, Givinostat is a histone deacetylase inhibitor. From now on, I will be calling this an NHDAC inhibitor. It is an oral suspension. So, uh, the uh, boys in the trial that I'm going to describe uh, um, in a second have been taking Givinostat as an oral suspension twice a day for, uh, as you will see, more, more than four years. Um, in total, because we have been working on Givinostat for quite a long time, uh, we now have data on more than 500 subjects they have been enrolled in different trials, uh, uh, and uh, of these, uh, uh, 51 are actually uh, children. They have been treated in uh, two, in three different trials. One was, uh, two were in juvenile arthritis, and one is the uh, Duchenne trial that I'm going to describe in a second. Okay, we, uh, the way we figure Givinostat works uh, is that, um, uh, is what I'm going to describe uh, and now. So, uh, as we know, uh, the uh, key issue in uh, Duchenne is the lack of dy dystrophy. And as dystrophy acts as a shock absorber in the muscle, the lack of dystrophy means that there is a repeated damage of uh, the muscle fibers. This triggers uh, a very common uh, event uh, in uh, our body, which is uh, chronic inflammation. And the result of the chronic inflammation is that uh, muscle regeneration is reduced and uh, uh, muscle fiber necrosis, fatty replacement, and fibrosis are increased on the other hand. And the result of that is a, a damage of the muscle uh, that you can see in the histology picture that is um, um, in, uh, in this slide. The way we believe Givinostat works is by acting on the downstream event in this disease. So, uh, obviously, Givinostat cannot restore uh, dystrophy, but we believe that it can actually significantly reduce all the events that occur uh, downstream of the lack of dystrophy. So uh, the uh, way Givinostat will work is by reducing chronic inflammation, uh, reducing the muscle fiber necrosis, the fatty replacement, and the fibrosis, and by increasing the muscle regeneration. And as a result of all that, we believe that uh, Givinostat can actually uh, if you want to reduce the damage of uh, uh, the muscle tissue and uh, uh, hopefully uh, make sure that the muscle tissue is closer to uh, a healthy tissue 
as the one that is described in this slide. And uh, these data have been, um, this event actually has been shown in uh, a preclinical model some time ago. And these results actually uh, in the preclinical model have triggered the phase two study, which I'm going to describe in a second. So the phase two study was st started uh, four years ago. Uh, the main objective of this study was actually to replicate the preclinical histological findings that I described before in uh, the mouse uh, to replicate these results in humans. The uh, study included uh, uh, 20 boys. The, their age was uh, um, at least seven years uh, and uh, less than 11 years of age. They had to be on stable corticosteroids for at least six months and they had to be able to perform the six minute walk test uh, with a result of at least 250 meters. Uh, obviously, given the <coughs> type, the, the way Givinos that works, uh, there was actually no restriction in terms of genetic mutation. Um, the study was uh, originally a two uh, part study. The first part uh, um, was aimed at identifying the best dose to be used uh, in these uh, uh, boys. And then in the second part of the study, the dose that was selected in the first part was used for one year. And at the end of the one year of treatment, uh, we took a second biopsy and looked at the histology of this biopsy. And the results are actually summarized uh, here. Let me spend a few seconds in explaining what these bars are. So uh, when you look at the muscle biopsies, you are looking at different parameters. The first parameter is what is called muscle fiber area fraction, meaning uh, how much of the biopsies is occupied by muscle fibers. The second parameter, uh, moving to the right, is total fibrosis, so how much of the biopsy is occupied by fibrosis. Uh, the third one is total necrosis, once again, how much of the biopsy is occupied by necrotic tissue. And uh, uh, last uh, is how much uh, of the biopsy is occupied by fat. And uh, the other important thing to mention is that each color bar that you see uh, in all the four sections represents one child. And the uh, black bar that you see is actually the mean of uh, uh, the result of, of the 20 boys. And as you can see, there is an increase in muscle area, uh, muscle fiber area fraction in every child with uh, an average increase of 29%. The reverse is uh, uh, observed for fibrosis. So there is a, a decrease of fibrosis in every child with an average decrease of 27%. Total necrosis went down in all child, uh, all children except one. Uh, with a, an average reduction of 43%. And fatty replacement also went down uh, in all uh, kids except one with a, an average reduction of 37%. And as you can see, all these results have been uh, highly significant and uh, we have published these results uh, uh, in 2016. Obviously, as we are now in the um, fourth extension of the study and the kids have been on treatment for now uh, more than four years, we can now look at uh, endpoints which become uh, important and significant given the age of the, of the uh, boys in the study. As you can see, the average age at baseline was uh, 8.6 years and is now 13 years with uh, uh, boys from the age of 11 to the age of almost 15 years. And so this uh, table is actually summarizing how many uh, boys actually have lost the ability of performing the standard uh, uh, function test. Uh, meaning the six minute walk test, 
the time to walk 10 meter and the time to rise from floor. And as you can see, uh, at the end of the fourth year, uh, month 48, uh, there are three uh, kids that actually have lost the ability to perform this test. It's also important to underline that actually two of them uh, had uh, uh, suffered from a uh, bone fracture, from a femur fracture. As the children are, uh, as the boys are getting older, also some other parameters become actually important, uh, namely the uh, respiratory function uh, test. And here what I'm uh, showing is actually the result after three years we are actually cleaning the data for the fourth year, and uh, so as soon as they are available, I will be sharing those results. But currently, we are looking at the results after three years. And as you can see, the uh, vital capacity uh, is actually uh, stable uh, in these uh, boys. And uh, if we look at the PEP, so the uh, peak expiratory flow, which is another parameter of how the uh, respiratory muscle work, this is actually uh, either stable or increasing. And obviously, given the age of these kids, uh, we would be expecting a, a reduction of these parameters, which is something that we are seeing. Yeah. Okay, in terms of safety, obviously all these studies are uh, always looking at uh, adverse events uh, in uh, um, the um, children and boys that are on treatment. And what we have seen is actually what we were expecting, namely a reduction in platelet counts. This is a measurement, uh, it's, it's a lab parameter. And uh, this is, as I said, something that was expected it was only a lab finding, so it never translated into uh, other problems like hemorrhage. And uh, uh, it is also uh, highly manageable. So by adjusting the dose uh, in each boy, we can then uh, maintain the platelet within the normal range. The second adverse event, group of adverse events that uh, were also expected were uh, gastrointestinal adverse events, and also these were actually manageable, and none of these actually led to uh, discontinuation of the study drug. Okay, let me then switch to the APD study, which is the study which is ongoing and is now open also in the U.S., and I will be describing uh, all the details of this study in a second. So the study, which is called APDIS, uh, the APDIS study, uh, the objective of the study is to demonstrate that Givinostat preserves muscle mass and slows down the disease uh, progression. And uh, we will be doing that by looking at different parameters. First of all, the functional effects. Uh, using the standard function test that you are well aware of, but we will be also uh, measuring the effect of the drug on fat replacement uh, using MRI. And this will be done in half of the uh, children of the boys uh, included uh, into the study. Let me uh, also underline one thing, which is the uh, Obviously, because we already have the histology results uh, from the previous studies, as I described, there will be no biopsy in the EPD study. Uh, in terms of the inclusion and exclusion criteria, once again, uh, there will be no genetic mutation restriction. Uh, we are looking for uh, uh, boys uh, that are uh, six, uh, at least six years and older. We have not put a limit uh, at the, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, maximum age. Also, in this case, the uh, boys have to be on steroids for at least six months on a stable dose, uh, and they need to be able to perform the Forster Klein test uh, in uh, no more than eight seconds and to perform the time to rise in less uh, than ten seconds. Uh, as uh, um, 
MRI will be performed. Uh, the uh, boys that are included in the MRI cohort, obviously, uh, must have no contraindication to perform this test. <clears throat> this is the uh, design of the study. Uh, as you can see, this is a, a double-blind placebo control study. The randomization, so uh, the uh, treatment that the kids will receive will be two to one. So uh, the 66% uh, of the boys will receive Givinostat, while the 33% uh, will receive placebo. Uh, all boys will be treated for 18 months. And as you can see there at the end of the study, uh, all the boys that wish to do so can then transfer to uh, the long-term safety study, which is already open. Um, screening will be uh, done in uh, four uh, plus or minus two weeks, and this includes uh, two clinical visits at the site plus uh, the MRI. And if the uh, boy passed the uh, all the inclusion and exclusion criteria, then uh, they will be randomized to the treatment, as I said, Givinostat or placebo. And as you can see, uh, the, the stars uh, show when the MRI is, is done. It's done at baseline, uh, sorry, in the, in the screening phase, at 12 months of treatment, and then 18 months of treatment. So what uh, should you expect for, for uh, uh, your boy? Uh, obviously, the, uh, a, an informed consent has to be signed uh, with the assent uh, uh, by the boy. And then they will have to attend clinical visits uh, for a total of 15 visits uh, uh, during the whole study. Uh, in the first three months, uh, the visit will be more frequent namely every week in the first month, then every two weeks in the second month, and then at the third month. Uh, after that, uh, the uh, visit will be every three months. Also, uh, another point which is important to uh, underline is that for some visits, especially in the initial part, which are uh, aimed uh, at uh, identifying the most appropriate dose based on platelet count. Uh, the, uh, we actually have a system by which the nurse will come to uh, your house uh, to collect the blood uh, uh, from, uh, from your boy. So there is no need actually to travel to uh, the uh, clinical site. Uh, the MRI, as I said before, will be done uh, at uh, screening 12 months and 18 months. And there uh, you will, uh, you may actually have to travel to the MRI site because as you will see in a second, uh, the number of MRI sites is limited. The muscle test will be performed every three months. The uh, pulmonary function test uh, will be performed at baseline 12 and 18 months, and as I said, uh, uh, at baseline 12 months and 18 months, there will be a thigh muscle MRI. In terms of uh, the drug that has to be taken, it is, as I said before, uh, a, a double-blind trial, so you will not know whether you are taking Givinostat or placebo, but in any case, the treatment that you are going to, that the boy is going to receive is a neural uh, solution that has to be taken in a fed state uh, twice a day. So uh, ideally uh, at breakfast and then uh, uh, 12 hours later uh, after a, a dinner or a sliced snack uh, before going to bed. The reason why uh, we are giving the drug uh, on a, a fed state is not because uh, there is a need to use food uh, to ensure uh, that it is properly absorbed, but it's due to the fact that actually the uh, suspension is actually bitter. And so if you give it with food, uh, namely solid food, uh, that actually uh, reduces the bitterness uh, of the drug. 
Uh, as we were describing before, uh, there will be uh, some traveling uh, to the clinical site and to the MRI site, and uh, reasonable expenses uh, will be reimbursed, and we are actually using a, a company which is called Patient Primary that will support uh, uh, the boy and the family in the uh, traveling and with all the expenses. And as I mentioned before, um, at the end of the trial, uh, all the kids will be invited to uh, transition to the long-term safety study, where obviously all kids will be treated with GDNOSTAT. This is uh, a map of the United States with the uh, sites that are uh, active in, uh, in the trial. The uh, uh, green dots uh, are the recruiting sites that, uh, as you can see, are placed in different states uh, uh, in the United States, while the red dots uh, are, um, uh, sorry, and, and the, the, the green dots are the sites which are already open. The uh, red dots are the sites that are in the process of actually getting, uh, of being open. Then the other uh, mark that you see here are stars. The stars are actually identifying the MRI site. And as you can see, as I mentioned before, there are uh, seven MRI sites. So uh, people that are not uh, um, at the same uh, uh, site that corresponds to the MRI sites will have to travel. Finally, let me thank, uh, uh, obviously, all the uh, family and kids that have already participated in our study and hopefully will uh, join the APD study and all the different organizations that have been uh, very helpful uh, to actually set up uh, all the different uh, studies that we have already conducted and will be conducting. Uh, let me also point out that you will be able to actually find more information uh, on uh, uh, two websites, which are the ones that are listed there. One is the classical clinical trials.gov, where you can find the information related to the study, but you can also go to the uh, patient advocacy at italpharmaco.com to get more information. And with that, we can go to the uh, question and answer session. Great. Thank you, Paolo. This was, that was really, really helpful. We've had a few questions come in, and I have some questions as well. So if you wouldn't mind going back to your slide number 11, can you put that back up? We're getting there. Yeah. <laughs> Be patient. Yeah. Takes a minute. Okay. One. More. Okay. So one of the questions that I have, uh, there's a couple questions that I have around this. You know, at, at week 48, when when you described here the three children who you know on the six minute walk test and the time uh, time to walk three meters and uh, the rise from the floor, are those the three the same three children? listed below at 16% who lost the ambulation? Yeah, they are the same three okay. children. Yes, yeah, so it's three children out of 18. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear in, instead of um, worried that maybe some people are adding up those numbers as opposed to looking at three patients no. out of the 18. There was also a question, have you seen, do you have the data on any increases you might have seen in the six-minute walk test? Uh, there have been uh, increases in few kids, especially in the first year of treatment. Uh, uh -huh. We are extracting all the data uh, of the fourth year uh, as we speak, so we can be, give more details uh, uh, once we have all this uh, uh, data analyzed. Okay. And did you do any psychological assessments um, or patient-reported outcomes along with this, uh, this first study? The uh, PEDSQL was actually used uh, in this study, uh, as you uh, are probably well aware, is not a particularly mm -hmm. sensitive tool, 
و این اول ایت واز اصلی این لاین ویت دی ریزالت دی وی هاف اوبتین ویت دی ادر فانکشنال تست دی ایشو اول ایز هیر ویت دی ستادی اند دی فیس تو ستادی است دی وی دی نو هاف این انترنل کنترول اند سو اوبسی وی آر ریلاینگ اون ایدر نیچرال هیستوری دیتا or data published uh, for uh, uh, other uh, clinical trials to understand whether uh, if you understand the real meaning of the result. This is always the, 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 the problem with this phase two results. Uh, let me also uh, underline that obviously this study was aimed at understanding the histological result uh, because for all the other consideration, the study was not the perfect design. Right. So, and and it was a small study as well, um, yeah, and right. dose escalation, right? So, so what you were really looking at as asking the questions: What is the therapeutic dose, and what changes do you see in the muscle tissue that would um, really um, demonstrate the the um, uh, biology, basically, of uh, of the target engagement of genetic It's a perfect. So, one of the questions. Okay. So, one of the questions that has also come in is. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, have you seen any distinct changes with regard to mutation? I think the answer you might agree with would be with 18 patients, it's very, it's very, uh, would be very difficult to make an assessment based on mutation to suggest a specific mutation might do better or, or not better on this drug. So, um, in the next study, uh, you, you may well do some analysis on that, um, because it's so large. Um, but anyway, then, uh, but, uh, sorry, let, let me expand one second on this because uh, obviously we did look at whether we had different histological effects based on uh, the type of um, a genetic defect being uh, a duplication, point mutation, or deletion. And uh, the results are all in all similar. So it doesn't look like we had different histological effects, whether we had a deletion or a duplication or a point mutation. Okay. Which would make sense given the pathology and the role of inflammation and fibrosis and so on. Right. Um, yeah. So if we can move then to slide 16. Yep. Okay. So one of the questions, uh, and so... In the in the phase three study that you, you are recruiting for at this moment, um, one of the questions is around the time to rise test. And if you'll just describe what we mean in time to rise, and so in, what, in, that time, in that getting off the floor, if someone's able to use any support, you know, the arm of a chair or anything such as that. No, they are. Uh, uh, so the test uh, will obviously be uh, rising from uh, a flat position. Uh, to standing from the floor and has to be performed without uh, uh, help. <clears throat> okay, great. I just wanted that clarified. Um, so, and again, on slides, if you'll move to the next slide, slide 17. Yep. So a couple yep. questions here are around um, six months steady state on steroids. Is there a preference in terms of prednisone or diplazacort? Is there a preference in terms of the um, the the regimen that a, pay, a person is on, whether daily or or ten and ten or weekend dose, um, or it's all comers. No, it's uh, all comers. Uh, what will happen is that the uh, boys will be stratified. So it's something that obviously the boy will not realize, but. Uh, when uh, uh, we enter the data into the database, they will be stratified based on whether they take uh, the Flazacort uh, or another steroid and whether they take uh, uh, daily doses or uh, uh, alternative treatments. But as I said, right. this is something that nobody will notice is, is uh, a data management tool. That the regimen or, or the only... The only um, Worry is the um, the six month steady state on whatever it is, but there is no worry about what kind of regimen uh, these these young boys are on. Right. Yes. Okay. And then, as we look at the length of the study, eighteen months for as you know is a, a is a 
a long study. I, we all certainly recognize the need to look longer. Um, and I guess one of my questions was around, will you do an interim look? Uh, are you planning to um, sort of look at maybe after nine months of treatment or 12 months of treatment to see see the treatment effect um, and, and to make a decision to go to perhaps consider uh, next steps in terms of if you see a distinct and definite change uh, thinking about um, moving toward uh, the regulatory approval process. Okay, so the study will actually have two interim analyses. Uh, the first one uh, will be done uh, once uh, 50 kids uh, actually have completed 12 years of treat uh, 12 months of treatment, and uh, it will be based uh, purely on MRI results and uh, uh, it will be a futility analysis. So this means right. that if we look at the MRI and see the uh, placebo is either the same or uh, even better than Givinostat on MRI, then we will be stopping the trial and looking better at all the data and, and deciding what to do. Uh, the second uh, interim analysis will be performed uh, once we have a hundred uh, uh, kids that have completed 12 months of treatment. And here we will have an independent uh, monitoring committee that will look at the data. They obviously will be unblinded, so we will not be looking at the data ourselves. And if the results uh, meet some uh, pre-specified criteria that we will be discussing um, in, in a few months. Uh, if these results meet the criteria, then uh, we, uh, will, um, we will receive from the committee the uh, summary of the results, and uh, we will be uh, using those results to actually go to the regulatory authority asking for an accelerated approval. In the meantime, the study will continue. And uh, uh, another important thing to mention is that because we want to preserve the blinding of the study, once we have uh, the second interim results, we cannot share them with the community. So uh, the uh, results uh, that will be shared with the community will be only the final results. Right. And, and Paolo, as the 64 subjects are on placebo and obviously the whole 200 subjects in the study, should any individual within that study lose ambulation, they would still be eligible in terms of, of having open label at the end of the study until a decision is made, whether a regulatory decision or an internal decision. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, let me clarify. So uh, one thing which I didn't mention is, is the total number of, of uh, boys which is 192, uh, and uh, um, yeah, uh, you are perfectly right. Uh, so in essence, if the kids lose ambulation, they will remain on the study anyway, complete the 18 months of treatment, and then uh, uh, they will uh, um, be um, they can transition to the long-term safety study uh, to take uh, uh, Givinostat. Right. Thank you. And then at the screening period, you're going to, genet to have genetic uh, test results on all these kids as they enter as well, right? Yeah, that's correct. The, um, so in essence, if the kids already had the test, the, the genetic test, there is no need to actually repeat the test. But then uh, if the test is not available, then uh, we will be uh, uh, conducting the, the genetic test. Great. Thank you so much. And then if we will move into uh, slide number 18. Uh, yep. Okay. And just a couple a couple questions on, on slide number 18. Um, you talked about these MRIs, and so first of all, some of the blood draws will be at a home site or a local site, right? So the, the families that are participating won't be trans tra won't be traveling to the clinical site for these blood draws. Rather, they will be drawn by this uh, group that you've the Illingworth Research Group, which means that the nurse uh, will, or the technician will come out to the home and draw the blood. Is that right? Right. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, but another question, if you're at a clinical site um, that is not an MRI site, 
it would involve you going both to both the clinical site for the study, but also to the MRI site at the at the baseline 12 and 18 months for that MRI baseline and MRI evaluation. Is that correct? This is correct. Yes. Okay. Fine. Uh, let, let, um, let me let, let me expand one second here because. Uh, obviously, as we know, uh, the, in the MRI, uh, we need to uh, keep the variability as low as possible. And unfortunately, uh, a significant part of the variability is actually related to the acquisition of the MRI. So uh, that's the reason why we have limited the number of MRI sites that we'll be conducting, that we, we will be scanning the, the boys. <clears throat> Right. Um, so in the imaging DMD study, I think as a community, we've learned that um, the acquiring of that and the standardization of the um, the data and also the standardization of the, the machinery itself and, and the uh, computers is, is really important so that you have accurate and consistent um, testing throughout. So it, it, it just is important for families to know that it could be that if their clinical site isn't an MRI site, that will involve three visits baseline, 12 months and 18 months, to the MRI site that is, um, is, is connected to their clinical site. So just to kind of have that in your, in your head as you consider joining the study. There are some questions around, um, there are some questions about the possibility, uh, well, first of all, there's a question around trying to compare um, um, uh, Javinistat with other compounds in trials, and I think the answer to that is, until we have approvals and until we have more data from these studies, we, we can't be, there is no way to compare compounds. And I know this sort of is the parent's heart of trying to make a decision about what trial to join, but unfortunately, um, we on this call and, and certainly without data couldn't, couldn't compare one to another to another. And that leads into the question of, will Javinistat, um, as it, it moves through the process, should it be approved, would it be useful in combination with other drugs? And, and certainly we believe that there will be a cocktail or should be a cocktail to treat Duchenne. So maybe, Paolo, if you could just comment on the need for combination therapies and how you see Javinistat fitting into that. Yeah, I mean, the I think we all agree that uh, the drugs that we have in our hands at this moment um, unlikely will uh, resolve uh, uh, the Duchenne, uh, um, the Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And that most likely they will all uh, bring uh, uh, part of the solution, but that really a combination of different drugs uh, is probably what we are looking for. And uh, I think Givinostat fits very well with this concept. Uh, clearly the fact that uh, the Givinostat is working downstream of, uh, of the uh, genetic defects uh, uh, immediately uh, triggers the idea of actually combining, let's say, a genetic modifier drug with Givinostat. Uh, but then I imagine that there are uh, also uh, a, another number of, Givin of uh, combinations that one could think uh, uh, for Givinostat. Uh, Pat, I just wanted to um, say one thing because obviously you mentioned the imaging DMD. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. imaging DMD is uh, running the MRI study for us. Yes, that, that's what I figured, and that's what, why I brought it up because uh, I know that um, having um, been working with the imaging DMD for a number of years, uh, I recognized and, and learned about some of the real difficulty of making sure that this is a solid, the data is, is um, consistent across sites, and they work really hard on that. So I'm glad you're you're working with them. There are some of the questions that are coming in back to the MRI. Is if you're at w one clinical site um, for an MRI, are you able to? If you're in the area of another, so are you able to to use different MRI clinical sites, or for a given patient, you would want a consistent MRI site? Is that correct? Yeah, we need a consistent MRI site. Yes. Right. And all patients, every single patient in the study, all, all of them will have MRIs at baseline 12 and 18 months. Is that correct? No. The, actually, the MRI will be performed in what we call the MRI cohort, uh, which is, in essence, the first 100 patients enrolled in the study. Oh, yeah. Sorry. The first 100 patients. Yes, that's right. I apologize. Okay. And um, as we move forward, if we could go into slide 20. 
Great. We're there. Hey. Okay. So um, in the number of patients you're recruiting, you list here the, the sites that are in the United States and Canada. You also have uh, sites all over the, the world. Is that true as well? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we have uh, other sites uh, in Europe uh, for a total of 20, I believe. 20 in Europe? So 20. Yeah. So uh, other 20 in, in, in all, is that right? Yeah. So it's, it's 40 sites in total. So it's okay. uh, 20 in North America and 20, 20 in North Europe. America and 20 in Europe, yes, and, and then recruiting the total number of children. Um, so one of the questions that has come about in terms of, of sites is if you start at one site and you relocate, whether it's in the U.S. or Europe or Canada, would you be able to change those sites? Um, would you be able to change from site in, in for instance, uh, um, it, Gainesville, Florida, we'll say, to a site in Minneapolis, Minnesota, if you relocated? I believe this should not be a problem. I suspect that uh, um, I, I'm trying to think about the the GCP issue here. So, if the consenting has to be redone at the new site, I suspect that that will be needed. But in terms of the data, uh, that should not be a problem. Also, because. Um, one thing to uh, I want to underline is that we have actually we are using Atom to uh, make sure that all the functional tests are properly standardized both within the sites and uh, among the sites. So uh, with that in mind, I don't think that that should be an issue. Uh, as I said, the only thing that probably uh, might be needed is actually a reconsenting. So they have the informed consent has to be given once again to the uh, parents and the assent to the boy. Right. So um, so you have 40 sites, and that's a huge study. That, that is quite an undertaking, and we're really thankful for that. Um, but you aren't going to add any more sites. So 40 sites is, are the sites, and those are the consistent sites for the study. Is that correct? For the moment, yes. Uh, obviously, we need to look at how recruitment goes. Uh, the study has just started. And, uh, and so, uh, depending on how rapidly we are able to recruit the, uh, these kids, um, we will then decide. Uh, obviously, keep in mind that uh, we, have, we, we need to recruit uh, 200 kids almost, and that's uh, a very large group. Yeah, it is a very large group. So, um, another question, Paolo, is if my child was involved in a uh, another study, an antimyostatin study or, um, or um, and for that matter, um, any other study, we'll say, without listing lots of them. And that, my son had completed the study itself and was on the extension of that study. Would they be eligible to join your study? So what we, ha we are asking for is some uh, actually treatment are exclusionary, but are, is actually very limited. Most of them, what we are asking for is for a washout period that can vary between a few weeks uh, or uh, two or three months. Um, what I suggest is that if you go to the uh, two websites which I mentioned before, you will see uh, the specific details on which treatment uh, uh, should have a washout and for how long. All right, thank you. So, um, and in the United States, um, we are lucky enough to have an approval of Exondus 51. Would a young man who is on Exondus 51 steady state steroids for the six month period of time, would they be eligible to join this study? So, uh, being on Exondus 51 is actually exclusionary. Okay, good to know. Um, and, and then, as you as you know, in many families, there are often several young uh, young men with uh, the diagnosis. So, if one of of the children in the family um, is able to uh, meet the inclusion criteria and joins the study, have you considered a sibling protocol that at some point that sibling, whether older or very young, will be able to join the study or be considered? for, I don't mean for the study, if they don't meet the inclusion criteria, not at all. What I'm saying is, 
do you have a sibling protocol that is a certain moment in time? That sibling would be on open label as well. So this is, uh, we don't have it at the moment, uh, but uh, w the way we are looking at uh, uh, different future studies, because obviously we are also uh, thinking about non-ambulatory study and, uh, and this type of extension, if you want, of the uh, look at Givino study is that we are currently uh, parking uh, these ideas until we have the, uh, you know, the, uh, if you want, the futility analysis. So once, uh, uh, and we hope that will be the case, the futility analysis is passed, then uh, uh, these type of trials will be uh, considered. Okay. And do you have any exclusion criteria for uh, cardiovascular disease or, or ejection fraction or any uh, any mar markers in, in, in the heart for children with Duchenne? So uh, what, uh, we are actually doing uh, a, a, a cardiac uh, and echocardiography at the beginning and at the end of the study, and we are uh, excluding uh, subjects that have an ejection fraction less than 50%. Okay. There, there are, uh, there is a question about, um, if someone is interested in becoming a center to, for the study, could they contact you directly and have that discussion and be on some sort of a list that should you need more centers, they might be, um, considered in some way? Absolutely, yes. As I said, we, we have a, a number of sites currently, but whether that number uh, will be sufficient to uh, recruit uh, all these kids, uh, and especially with the timeliness that we have in mind, uh, is uh, uh, still to be proven. So uh, we will be happy to uh, talk to other sites. Okay, and and when in the previous study the children are still on extension, so you haven't had anyone discontinue the drug. Uh, um, I see on the data there there might have been two that dropped out of the study, but you didn't see any. Any effects of discontinuing the drug on them? In so, uh, of the, um, you, you are right. Uh, two kids actually are not uh, on the study on him anymore. Once uh, one child actually uh, left the study very early on uh, during the uh, part one of the study because uh, he had uh, a uh, drop in platelets that met the stopping criteria, and this was actually mm -hmm. at a dose that was considered not tolerated. Uh, the second child actually stopped, uh, uh, in a sense, withdrew his consent uh, at the end of the second year of treatment. Uh, what we understood from uh, his parents was that he didn't want to participate in clinical trials anymore. All the others are actually... All the others remained. So um, as we think about inclusion criteria for, for our studies, um, in your particular study, it's um, time to rise from floor in the fourth stair climb. Um, as we know, some, some of the young men that are diagnosed with Duchenne and some girls that have Duchenne have some cognitive issues, and sometimes it is um, uh, difficult to work through and, uh, and, and may, uh, in fact, cause some difficulty for them to participate. But do you have any limitations in terms of Cognitive factors or, or willingness to participate or uh, ability other than ability to perform the test that you've included in your study. So this is really up to the investigator. Uh, so if the uh, cognitive uh, um, impairment uh, is such that they can still uh, be part of the study, uh, perform all the different tests, uh, and uh, if you unfollow. Uh, all the rules of the study, uh, the investigator can uh, actually recruit them. Uh, as I said, it, it's really up for the, to the investigator to uh, decide whether the level of cognition uh, is sufficient to um, perform the study. Great, thank you. And we have um, um, a mom from Croatia who is saying that um, she really would love to be considered for the study. She'd love for her child to be considered for the study. Um, but her position in Croatia is, is really um, out for a bit. And could she contact the site in Germany um, directly? So this is actually possible. Uh, they can contact the site. 
and uh, we are actually considering the possibility of having uh, uh, children and boys that actually live outside the country uh, go to the site uh, in the selected countries uh, of the study. Uh, obviously, there are some uh, regulatory and legal implications that are different in each state, so uh, that has to be uh, taken into consideration. Another important um, matter to, to consider is that obviously we need to make sure that the standard of care uh, in uh, uh, Croatia or any other country where uh, kids uh, would be traveling from is actually the same as the one that uh, we are uh, asking for in the, in the study. But that is clearly something that the site will evaluate uh, and make sure that this is the case. Okay, great. And so um, one final question as we're getting near to the hour, um, and that is, as you know, in the United States um, and perhaps abroad, uh, as well, people, young um, young individuals with Duchenne are on Deflaz Accord. And so that Deflaz Accord arrived, it came from a variety of sources, um, from obviously it's available in Europe, but more recently in the United States we have an approval um, of Inflaza. So one of the questions is around, are, do you see any impact from a change from prednisone to Inflaza or Deflaz Accord that you've gotten from abroad to Inflaza? Um, are you accounting for that? Or are you concerned about that they that might cause some um, difficulty in, in terms of inclusion criteria in the study itself? So the when I mentioned before about the six month stability of steroids, that means that they have to be on the same steroid. So whether they were on the flazacor, they had to be on the flazacor for six months and there should be no switch from one type of steroids to another within this time. And this should be the same within uh, uh, during the study. So they have to remain the, on the same. Right, but the source of the deflazacort, whether it's deflazacort from um, abroad or Mexico or whether it's the Implaza product, is of you're not concerned about that? Correct. This is correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, this has been very helpful, Paolo, and we're so excited about your study, and, and certainly it's, it's a huge undertaking for you, um, and we're very excited about seeing the interim results or, or at least hopefully hearing about good results so that you can go on a regulatory process forward, knowing that you can't share interim results with us directly. But we're excited about this study. For those of you on the phone, um, interested in, in being a study, uh, into, interested in study site, contact Paolo directly, and um, for those of you who are interested in study this study, please speak to your physician. This is a really interesting uh, opportunity for our community, and the HVAC inhibitors have been studied for many, many years, and it's so good to see this one, come, Javinistat, coming into our community. So thank you very much, Paolo, and again, we apologize for the slight technical difficulties, but this has been very helpful and very productive. No Paolo, problem. Thank yes. you. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, let, let me thank you again because, I mean, this webinar is obviously very important also for us, and uh, obviously we need all your support to make this study happen. Yes, thank you. So, please, for all of you listening, um, this webinar will be posted very shortly. Please um, ask in, in your friends, um, spread the word on Facebook, a really important study and, and one that we will learn a great deal about the drug Javinistat but also a great deal about the, the children in the study and, and the genetics of the study and certainly the outcome measures of the study and the imaging. So it's a really critical study for many, many reasons. Thank you again, Paolo, and we will look forward to seeing you very soon. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye.